Welcome to the March 26, 2024 City Council and School Board Joint Work Session. As we convene today, let us remember the significant impact that our decisions have on the lives of our residents, particularly our youth. Our schools are not just buildings where education takes place. They are the bedrock of our society, shaping the minds and the character of our next generations. It is through dialogue and cooperation that we can address the challenges facing our city and schools and seize the opportunity that lie ahead. I encourage all of us to approach today's discussions with open minds, a spirit of collaboration, respect, and a commitment to the common good. Before we begin with our agenda for the afternoon, I'd like to first offer the floor to School Board Chair Dr. Atul Gupta. Dr. Gupta, would you like to say a few words? I just wanted to say thank you for all for coming, and I look forward to a positive uh, uh, exercise where we can do some good for these kids. As uh, Reddy said, one of the parents from Sandusky Elementary said last time, it's all about kids. And in all this um, push back and forth, we forget that end of the day, we are here to provide a quality education to kids, young men and women who are relying on us to take care of them so they can build a future for themselves. So thank you, Mayor, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you so much. Our first item on the agenda is to receive a presentation on the Lynchburg City Schools fiscal year 2025 budget. To help us move expeditiously, expeditiously through this process, after the presentation, by raise of hand and an acknowledgement, I will recognize you if you have any, question, any questions or comments for staff. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Crystal Edwards to walk us through her presentation. Please allow her to get through her full presentation before asking any questions or making comments. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I will be tag teaming with my team um, on certain parts of this. I do wanna say that there are more slides here than we're actually gonna spend time talking about, so I don't want anyone to get scared. Um, but they're there for contextual reasons so that folks can go back and review anything that they need. Uh, and again, uh, as Mayor Reed said, it will help us to hold your questions to the end. We try to number the slides, so if there's a particular slide that you have a question on, if you just jot that number down, we'll keep this up. We can go back to that slide and answer any questions um, at the end. So I am going to get started here, and I'm going right off with some quick stats about our division. There are the number of schools that we have. Um, our ADM, as per our current uh, enrollment, February 2024, and you can see the ADM is separated by the total, how many pre preschoolers or pre-K students we have, and how many K-12 students. And for those of you who know the VDOE calc tool that predicts ADM, um, that is the prediction, 7254 7, for the current year, and you will note that we have 164 more students than what was predicted that we should have. Uh, also, current employees are 1495 FTEs, full-time equivalents. We do FTEs because our staff are shared amongst schools, so I might spend 60% of my time in one school and 40% of my time in another school, but together, that's one FTE and one position. Uh, and you can see, again, for the purposes of the VDOE for, uh, funding formula, how many SOQ supported, uh, support staff and how many SOQ instructional staff um, the VDOE uses in their calculation. And then for us, that's about 53% of our staff receive some degree of support via the formula for SOQ, and then 698 um, are not. A little bit more about our demographics, um, just our children, pre-K, and just some enrollment information regarding our, our babies. Uh, this slide I want to take a quick pause on. Uh, just This is on the uh, Virginia Department of Ed School Quality Profile. Again, more information about our students, and this is over a three-year period, the number of students enrolled in each subgroup. I'm just gonna highlight four students with disabilities. Um, is slightly down, as you can see there, although we'll talk later about the cost of serving those students with disabilities is up. Um, economically disadvantaged students, English lear language learners, and homeless students are up in our division. 
little more on demographics. How do we look inside the school buildings versus how the community looks? And you can see some differences between us and the community. Again, that's our fall school quality profile data, and that is the U.S. Census data for the community. And then, of course, the, we like to pause here. This is our mission statement, every child by name and by need to graduation and beyond, and our core beliefs. And then the thing that we like to say the most, seven, eight, nine, this is where we spend most of our time. We want our babies to spend seven quality hours with us. We want them to get at least eight hours of sleep, and we recognize that they have nine hours of family time and community time in a 24-hour day. So that's a quick bit about us. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wodeka. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Edwards, and good afternoon to friends and colleagues. Uh, you know, every time you start a budget process, you want to start it with a vision of what the future can be for our organization, for our community. And I just want to take a, just a brief moment to review some of that vision for Lynchburg City Schools and how this budget was developed uh, and where our priorities do lie. Um, so those of you who were at... The microphone is what's projecting back here, so we can tilt it up a little bit. Okay, I'll be, I'm sorry I'm taller. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so th those of you who were able to attend our State of LCS event uh, just a few months ago uh, and, and maybe have read about it since then, um, had the opportunity to hear about a vision that aligned instruction throughout our division, certainly between levels of schools, but also thinking about how we align uh, typical academic experiences, high quality academic experiences with really high quality career and technical education experiences throughout the system and having opportunities for students to experience and prepare for careers and jobs uh, well into their future, starting early in their, their, uh, their school experiences. Um, so what we wanted to do is just talk a little bit about how we envisioned this process and in this budget process and, and really the next couple of budget processes, some of our priorities for how we will achieve uh, the work that's required for high quality instruction that allows us to lead to the opportunity for students to engage in different opportunities that lead to to careers in the future. And what we call that is our high quality classroom plan. And that has three major components, some of which we're hoping to accomplish this year and others we will hopefully accomplish over a number of years that lead us to have the opportunity to really highly improve and engage and invest in high quality instruction. The first, of course, is high expectations for our staff and for our students. Uh, that relates to certainly behaviors and all the other things we talked about quite a bit. We have some investments that you'll, you'll hear about in just a moment uh, that lead to those uh, concerns, um, as well as opportunities to uh, engage with students in different ways. We also know that whether we like it or not, there's no way to get around that we have to be a leading compensation organization to attract really high quality instruction here in Lynchburg. Certainly. Uh, competitive, but more importantly, probably leading compensation for our staff. So we have some goals uh, that are stated in this, this year, but also that will come forward in the future. Um, and then finally, um, we uh, are focused on our commitment to, uh, to innovation and different opportunities that may be uh, apparent for the future. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Pugh, to talk more about this. Thanks, Dr. Wodica. I, uh, continuing that conversation around high quality classrooms, let's take a, a moment to pause and look at some academic growth data. Uh, the LCS School Board has a strong focus on academic achievement. Uh, and this year, the new Academic Success Committee has reviewed various achievement data, monitoring student progress and growth. When looking at longitudinal data or data over time, it's important to look at cohorts of students to see how the same group of students has progressed. Um, the chart here shows three consecutive years of the pass rate for the spring SOL assessment in the area of reading. These students are our current sixth graders. They are the um, graduation cohort of 2030. Uh, and in 2021, if you'll look at that first, um, the, the second column there, um, in 2021, these students were in third grade and they were just taking their first end of the year SOL, and they were also rebounding from the pandemic. Um, but what I want you to notice is that a steady increase is there in the pass rate for the same group of students in these five schools over the three years. Now we need to keep in mind that each year, learning for our students is based on new state standards and students have to gain more um, content and skills and information to show that improvement and growth. 
So some of these students have, you can see the graphic here is that visualization. Some of these students have been on a superhighway since third grade because they've had to catch up while also mastering new on grade level content um, while building on skills and contents taught in previous years. So, you know, in third grade, I'm taking that assessment that's built on my previous year's learning in kindergarten, first and second grade, but also that new content in third grade, and the same continues for fourth and fifth. So this uh, shows some strong academic growth in the area of reading, which is one of our uh, really important focuses in literacy in Lynch Varsity Schools. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brown. Thank you, Ms. Pugh, and we want to continue to speak about the work of the high-quality classroom that we're trying to create for all of our students in Lynchburg City Schools. Um, with the help of our amazing educators that we have, we've been able to redesign how we look at providing behavioral and mental health services and supports for all of our students in Lynchburg City Schools. And we, we have built a system that is ba based on high expectations and high care, because we know that if you have high expectations without a level of care, high level of care, you'll be uh, the main teacher that can't really build relationships with students. And if you have a high level of care without high expectations, then you're just loving students to failure, and we want to make sure that they are um, prepared well for the next phase of their life. And so this isn't just a program. This is an intentional system that's built on several components and tiered. In the tier one level, uh, we've been able to provide some supports and will continue to provide supports for teachers to increase their ability to have high quality classroom management and the support that they need with mental health and behaviors in the classroom. We've also created a restorative suspension center, which is getting some really great, amazing results, as well as two restorative academies to help teach students about their skill set and give them the, the skills they need to be successful in their base school. And we've also increased and improved the programming that we've had at our traditional alternative programs, at our TAP program, and at our Fort Hill Community School. And so just some of the preliminary data that we've had, this, this is a program we've been working on for the last year um, and, and as a, is a pilot. And um, we saw under a traditional LCS suspensions, at home suspensions, um, students were being resuspended at a rate of about 60%. So 60% of the time, if a student received a suspension out of school, and traditionally, they would get, get resuspended. We've nearly cut that in half with the restorative suspension center and seen a resuspension rate of about 32%, um, even more successful at the high school level. Across the division, we've been really pleased to see that at the secondary level, we've seen a 30 33.8 percent decrease in our violent and weapon offenses this year, uh, first semester compared to last semester uh, last year. And, and additionally, across the division, we're seeing a 7 percent decrease and uh, the division level of second 14 percent decrease at the secondary level for learning environment offenses. So we are seeing that this in intentional system is creating a better environment and a high quality classroom for our teachers. It's also allowed us to secure several uh, really competitive grants at the federal and state level to the tune of almost $10 million that has allowed us to increase services for mental health and behavioral support across the division. So um, I'm turning it back over to Dr. Edwards. Thank you. Okay. Um, we thought it was important to really showcase what our students were doing because we never want to forget that our main purpose is academics, right? We support them with behavior. We support them with um, social emotional but really we're looking at achievement and that is the work that we do and with that we also are right in the middle of our division um, literacy plan which will be coming to our school board at the end of this year it has to be approved by the school board and the uh, Department of Education as part of the statewide focus on literacy and when I tell you everything that we do from supplemental to tutoring and all has to be aligned with this plan, um, it's a big deal. So we're doing a lot of work on that. We've done two of four really intensive trainings and we have two more to go with the state VDOE. But that leads into how does CTE fit with reading scores? So I'm glad you asked, let me tell you. Um, here is uh, our annual report for CTE. And one of the things that I want you to, to look at is some of our the scores of the students who complete CTE. And those performance standards are not set by us. They are set by the VDOE, and that's their annual report. And you can see that in English, like 98% of the students are passing the SOL or end of the course tests, um, as well as 88.9 and 87.9 in, sci in science. 
Um, and also look at that graduation rate. And I want you to look at the middle one, 21, 22, when we came, came out of COVID and came back, it, it dipped. Um, but we're back up to having a high graduation rate for our students who participate in our CTE programs, which help us to focus on what should we be doing in the middle and elementary schools in terms of infusing more CTE experiences down at that lower level so that we can continue this great progress and exceed. And don't take my word for it. Let the kids tell you what they're doing. Um, this is just two of the organizations that we partner with. One is Skills USA, and I put there what their mission is, successful model of employer-driven youth development training. So if you are watching this at home and you are an employer, these are the things that our kids are doing. We are getting them ready for you. Um, and you can see they just had a couple competitions. They actually have states coming up. Um, and this is just a few of the, the success stories. There were too many to put on this slide, but we wanted to highlight drafting, cybersecurity, cosmetology, and criminal justice, CSI, as things that our kids not only are doing well in the building, but take it outside the doors of the building to across the state, and with, they're still doing very well. The second one is DECA, um, which if you look at their part of their mission, entrepreneurs for careers in marketing, finance, hospitality, and management. And again, our students are demonstrating excellence in the classroom and representing Lynchburg City Schools very well outside the classroom. And I would be remiss if I did not look at our service organizations, our junior ROTCs, and what we are most impressed with is if you look at our Marine Corps, and many of you know that they go to, to go um, compete for drills, they're in nationals for academics. So not only are they modeling civic responsibility, they're also modeling the high academics that we want. And our, our Air Force um, ROTC, I just think this is the perfect quote out of a child's mouth to illustrate um, what they feel about our junior ROTC program, that it, it's leadership, integrity, and discipline that they're, they're learning through this program. But let's not forget about serious fun, right? And that's what, what we want in our schools. We want our kids to learn and excel. We want them to have fun. And by the way, like Travis here, we want them to be able to fly a, a jet or a, a jet plane or, or, or an Air Force plane. Um, so those are the experiences that we're trying to provide for our children. Um, some other things, community involvement. Those of you who came to the Ed Foundation breakfast, thank you, Ed Foundation. I talked about the triangle being that supportive network, um, schools working together with par parents and community. There is tremendous community support for our students here. And again, I don't have enough space to put all the pictures on here, um, but you can see some of the partnerships that we have, like with the YMCA, they have a swim to work program. Um, we built a uh, food forest uh, in uh, RS Payne with the help of the university, um, sorry, Randolph University. University of Lynchburg is a great partner with us. Not only do they host a lot of our events for our students, but they also help us with um, strength-based learning and Good Gangs program you can see there. Uh, of course, Beacon of Hope and the Ed Foundation between their scholarships, their investment in children, uh, internships, uh, just wonderful, wonderful things. Uh, we built a playground at Bass through community assistance and a Kaboom grant. And we also are grateful for our mentors who came in from BWXT who worked with our elementary students talking all about engineering to our elementary students and that's just a few of the partnerships that we have but those partnerships are important so now that we've given you all the good news let's talk about some of the challenges that we have well thank you so you've heard from from three really wonderful and visionary educators about really wonderful things that are happening uh, now we're going to talk about the power bill in health insurance, and so that might not be as exciting, but it is very important for uh, where we are from a budgetary perspective. Uh, from a management perspective, I just want to talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, from a budget perspective, uh, on making sure that our budget lines are right size and aligns with actual costs and expenditures, uh, just really redeveloping some of our, uh, our management practices to ensure that our budget ref is reflective of our actual costs of operating. And so there's been some challenges with that over the last couple of years, so we've done, spent some time particularly in this budget Budget, making sure that the budgets that we are developing for things like utilities are really clearly reflective of the actual cost of what it takes to actually run a building. So what you see is over time uh, that uh, our, our utilities, electric, water, and uh, gas, uh, natural gas, has 
uh, increase uh, considerably over time. A large part of that is just related simply to the increase in rates and making sure that we get those budget lines right size, and that certainly just costs more money uh, over time and does require some additional uh, expenditure uh, from the city. Uh, so my colleague, uh, Sonny Jamie, is going to talk about health insurance. Which side? Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, members of City Council, Chairman, and distinguished members of School Board. Um, I always smile when I'm delivering some challenging opportunities. Um, so, as evidenced in the graphic, the top spending category for health insurance claims is cancer. It represents 18.6% of all claims submitted. Out of the top 10 high cost claimants for LCS members, five of those were for cancer, and two of those five were in the 500,000 to 999,000 cost category. Overall, there are 79 claimants currently being treated for cancer um, that are contributing to the increase of those health care costs. The cost to treat this form of illness continues to escalate as represented in the 94% increase in claim expenses per member per month, a 94% increase in those claims. The first quarter of 2024 shows an 87% increase in medical and pharmacy costs as compared to the first quarter in 2023. So, Currently, what can be done about this, you ask? So some of the strategies and efficiency and saving strategies that um, we at LCS are looking for is currently we're educating our workforce on prevention and wellness visits. That's the most important thing is to keep our employees healthy. Um, secondly, we are exploring other options outside of the self-funded platform that potentially can provide a bigger pool um, to equalize those costs somewhat. And we are also working with the LCS consultants to align and identify benefit savings to create a more affordable employer option while not outpricing our employees. So lo logistically, um, we'll not see immediate savings from these strategies, but we will be laying a foundation in order to see future savings, and that is our goal. Okay. I never thought that I would consider this to be a challenge, but giving raises and seeing increasing salaries for us um, can be a challenge when you have to provide additional revenue. I do want to pause and just kind of look at this SOQ chart. I get this question a lot. How many SOQ funded? How many not SOQ funded? SOQ is standards of quality, and that's a Virginia Department of Education um, term and measurement that is used in their funding formula. Our HR system that we record all our folks in does not tag an employee as SOQ or not SOQ. So we can't just push a button and run and see which ones are SOQ and not SOQ. Second is that the way that the Virginia Department of Ed um, uses their funding formula, their categories for SOQ don't necessarily match our exact positions. They lump them together and call them administrative technical or administrative professional, whereas we have positional titles like a director, a supervisor, a principal. Um, the other thing is folks want to want to ask who's SOQ and who's not, and my answer is yes. Everybody's SOQ and everybody's not at some point dependent upon what their salary is. So the way that the Department of Ed does this is they'll calculate a per student ratio and you'll get a number. And then they'll figure out what is the prevailing wage for that particular salary. Now you can imagine if you're a veteran staff, your salary is probably higher than that prevailing wage. So even though there is a very uh, genuine, gen generous effort to provide salary and additional funding for raises, it may not always cover everyone. So to break it down so we can see the difference between SOQ and not SOQ, I just went through the elementary and pulled a couple positions that I felt like our public would, would definitely understand, assistant principals, principals, librarians, counselors, and of course, 
K-5 teachers. And if you look in that first column, based on what the VDOE has, that is the projected number of SLQ funded positions. In other words, in their funding formula, they are using those numbers as the multiplier for how much money we're going to receive in various categories. If you look in column three, as of the current year, that's how many people we actually have teaching our students or working with our students in those positions. So when you look at column four, you'll see that there are several individuals, FTEs, that are not supported by SOQ funding. SOQ does not mean that is the number of staff that you need to operate efficiently. Nowhere in VDOE does it talk about that is the number. It is used to calculate or in a form formulaic way to figure out how much money each division will, will receive. So if you were to take all of those people in that fourth column and say, we don't need them, and I want you to think about that at the elementary level, just with the number of, of staff members there. Um, that's about $6 million that LCS has to contribute to making sure that we meet payroll and, and value our employees just in that column alone. To give you another, oh, wait, hold on, there was one more important thing I wanted to say on there. That bottom left chart is a snippet from the JLARC report. And if you remember, JLARC did a big study in Virginia and talked about SOQ funding. And that, those three bar graphs down there is the actual SOQ funding, and then what is actually happening in divisions, what we actually employ, and then what the labor force says. So you can see that to use the model of just SOQ funding to, to run a school or run a divi division, is not going to cut it. That's inefficient. Um, so what does that look like when we have these wonderful times like we had the last couple years where it's a 5% increase followed by a 5% increase followed by a 2% increase and as of yesterday maybe a 3 and a 3 all in a row. Where do those increases come from? Because LCS, we don't have any taxing authority, we don't have any revenue that we can generate in, in our role. Um, the state provides some of the funds for the SOQ funded people, and that's about 53% of our population. We, LCS and local community, with the help of our city government, have to provide the rest. So when you're watching the news and you hear teachers are getting a 3% increase, underneath that, about 62% of that is coming from the state, but only for SOQ funded people. And 100% of that is coming from other places. And if you keep an eye on a dollar like I do, this is what that looks like. So if you look at SOQ funded, those kindergarten teachers that were in column one, um, about 38% of that falls on the local government to match the contribution from the state. If you look at those people who were in the fourth column, all of those teachers, that 100% of that has to come from LCS and local government. And then what does that look like overall when you add those together? Overall, when we say LCS employees are getting an X percent raise, 67% um, of that has to come from us, okay? And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Day next. Thank you. Um, so um, I wanna speak to the graphic you see on the left-hand side there. This is one of several graphs I produced back in February, thank you. Um, I can tie my shoes now, you know, too. Um, um, to look at the history of the city and state allocations to the LCS operating budget. Now, when I did this, my intent was not to advance any particular agenda or support any particular uh, policy position. I just wanted to look objectively at the numbers. Um, you can find the rest of the document. There's several other sort of similar graphs uh, in a document entitled Budget History that's attached to the school board agenda of March 19th. And in particular, the sources of the data that produce this and the other graphs are identified in that document. So this particular graph shows the percentages of the LCS budgets for 2019 through 2024 that come from the city and the state, respectively. Um, you can see that the state's portion of the LCS budget has in 
increased from 54.4% up to 62.3%, while the city's portion has decreased from 43% to 36% over those years. So these, these comments that I've made are uh, uh, what's supporting the first two bullets you see there on the left-hand side. So what's important to note is that during this time when the, the state budget is increasing or state percentage contribution is increasing, our ADM is going down. So there's no discrepancy that we are seeing declining enrollment. But the cost for educating kids, just like the cost for almost everything else in your household, is going up, which is why the request for revenue, at least coming from the state end, even as ADM is going down, the state has been increasing um, the revenue to LCS. Uh, the other thing, just going back, go back to my previous slide when I said it's great that we're getting 3% um, increases. That's wonderful. But remember, where does that additional revenue come from? Um, and over the last couple years, the, the boards, this board, the previous board, have done some... Um, some gymnastics in terms of using CARES fund to provide that revenue. Um, we've streamlined, we've had um, cuts, reductions. Last year we even had RIFs to kind of provide that revenue. But at some point, your belt gets really, really tight and there's no other place. That's not a sustainable system. You cannot continue to say, I'm going to support my workforce and their increases by laying off their colleagues to pay for their increases. You, we are going to need to do some um, revenue generation for our, our folks. So what do we need to do? I'm going to stop right here because this is probably what the community wants us to do, at least um, when they come to our board meetings. This is what I hear them saying. They need us to work together. We are a team. Um, none of the children who are under 18 can come here and advocate for themselves, although I always invite them to the board meeting and let them tell us how they feel. But they don't vote, they don't advocate, they don't have a say. We do. So it is our responsibility to work together um, and uh, come up with a budget that is fiscally responsible, but also keep in mind that we do have about 7,900 children depending on us. And that's with declining enrollment, but there are still 7,900 children in this division that are, that are depending on us to do that. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wodeka to talk a little bit about what is the school board doing to help ourselves, and then we'll talk about city. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. And, um, you know, we've, we've plowed through quite a lot of information very quickly on each one of these slides, but we're going to take a moment uh, just kind of reflect on this slide and understand what this really means. So as you know, over the last couple of years, we've had some budget challenges. And last year, what we did was we said, you know what? Let's take a look at how we can make budget reductions in a way that impacts students as little as possible. We're going to take positions that don't in maybe interact with students on an everyday basis. Not that the work that they do isn't important, but maybe doesn't in interact with students on an every everyday basis. As we have gotten into this budget process, you've heard the numbers, right? Based on the, the, uh, the governor's proposed budget, now obviously that may change with the General Assembly, based on the idea of level funding, that put us in a position of being about $17.9 million in the deficit for the next year. We have put together a plan. The school board has looked at this uh, and taken a position to say, uh, you know, it's easy to sort of say, well, there needs to, we need to cut materials, uh, other operating costs, but not personnel. But when you have a very significant budget deficit like the one that we are projecting, we have to make decisions that are very, very difficult. And this is a very, very difficult slide uh, to put forth. So we started off and we said, well, let's look at division-based positions. Again, positions that are very important, but perhaps do not uh, on an everyday basis interact with students. And we identified about uh, 65 positions. That's now been reduced now to, to 49 positions based on some school board decisions. Um, looking at uh, the school division from across the perspective. Now, one thing we're going to ask of you, and I know there's been some questions on what specific positions those are from the, from the city council. We have shown that to uh, the school board in closed session because I need everyone to recognize that these are positions for people's jobs, their livelihoods, and we have not had the individual conversations with these folks as of yet. And the last thing that we want to do right now is for pe people to hear that on the news, right, or on, online. 
So we want to be able to have that conversation with individual employees if we get to that point, uh, if those positions are reduced. And then we said, well, you know, we need to start taking a look at some school-based position reductions, not something we've done for quite some time, certainly without, not want something we did last year. We asked principals to take a look at their budgets and make about a 5% reduction uh, on their budgets. Uh, and ultimately, when you have a school, you have a, maybe a, a few dollars here and there uh, that are supplies and art supplies and those sorts of things that maybe you can reduce to some extent. But the reality is the vast majority of our expenditures are teachers' instructional positions. And so you can see there, ultimately, where we have a plan to make significant reductions in instructional positions throughout the division. Now, this is not something that should be taken lightly. This is something that will absolutely impact uh, our students on an every single day basis. Um, and I think that we as a community have to re reflect on the fact of the investments that we need to make. On the other side of the screen there, on the, on the right side, you'll see some other uh, decisions and policy decisions that the school board uh, has, has, has taken a look at uh, and has included, and that includes some use of one-time money uh, for next year. Again, that's not a sustainable plan for the long run, but we're trying to sort of have this soft landing for next year to the best extent we can. But in total, we're talking about potentially 103 positions between schools and the division. So I'm going to say that again, 103 positions. That is absolutely devastating and monumental to the impact on our students. Okay, and as Dr. Wodek has said, we did meet in closed session with school board, because I know there's questions are, if these are vacancies, if these are other positions, these are people. They are people. We have names and things like that, and um, it is a bad place to be right now in terms of the work. What's really sad about this is we're at a point where we've heard our school board say, focus on academics and do the things that you need to do for academics. So we've been doing that. And as, as Ms. Pugh showed, the kids are coming back. They're, they're, they're making the progress um, that they need to get back on, on grade level. You'll see higher scores at the high school level. The second thing that we heard our school board say over time is focus on behavior. Let's make the classrooms a place where the teachers don't have to struggle. Help them have immediate solutions to some of the challenges that they're facing so that the children in their classroom, they can teach those kids while we work with the other children to make decisions. And you heard Dr. Brown talk about LCS Restore, things that we've put in place. We don't want to suspend our kids and just put them on at home, possibly unsupervised, um, and they're not going to make any different choices by being at home than they will by being in our LCS, LCS Restore program where we can really work on that. So we have done that. We've heard our school board say, um, we need to be competitive. We need to get our salaries up. We need a plan, a long-term plan for how we're going to be competitive. And we've done that. We've worked with um, school boards to really boost up the salary, not only for the teaching staff, but for um, our classified staff by moving to $15 an hour before the state required it. And let's face it, $15 an hour is not a lot. So I'm not bragging about that. It's one small step along the continuum. So those are the things that we want to continue to do. The investment in CTE um, and really doing the workforce piece. Right here in this building, um, maybe last week, I guess it was on Pi Day, March 14th, this building was packed with businesses and teachers. Businesses and teachers, our middle school teachers and staff came out and worked with local businesses. And the whole purpose of that event, that PI event is, here's what I do. You're preparing my next workforce. How can we work together? How can I come into your classroom and enrich your lessons, your students, so that we, right here in Lynchburg, have the workforce that we need? Again, that's another one of those long-term investments that we have been working on. And we're willing to do the hard work and make the cuts necessary to get us there, but we cannot do it alone. And the community has also said to us that they are very invested in their schools um, and they want to see us make f move, move forward with the excellence and the innovation that we have talked about. So that's our part. 
School board and I, we own the reduction, the reduction, the reduction, the reduction. City Council, we need your help with the revenue. So I'm going to ask Dr. Day to come back up um, and close us out with this last slide before we transition to the next to the question and answer session. Well, as you, if you followed the school board meetings, you know that the board has bounced back and forth um, on several occasions with the uh, amount we wanted to request from the city for their portion of our funding. Um, the, um, what we've settled on is to request from you $43.7 million. It's a bit more than uh, we've had from the city in several years now. Um, I think one of the things that the f board feels most strongly about is, is LCS Restore. Um, if we stop supporting that, not only will we lose, of course, it will, it will save us a, um, a little bit of money, but it's going to cost us a lot because, as was pointed out, there's about $2 million in grant money that comes in with that. If we stop funding it, we lose that $2 million. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the board as a whole, I think, feels quite strongly that that's um, one of the most significant things we can do to help our students improve. Um, so that's pretty much why, where this number is coming from and why it's higher <laughs> than um, what a flat funding amount would be. Um, <clears throat> also, um, we still don't know the final set of numbers we're going to get from the state. Uh, Every couple days, we get a little bit more news about it swinging this way and that way. There has been some uh, recent uh, new information in the last couple days, which the staff have not been able to incorporate into this because it's just coming too fast at us. Um, um, this is based on the governor's budget, which um, includes a 1% bonus rather than across the board pay raise, which is quite different. Um, so um, pretty much you can see what's here. Um, there's a list of priorities at the bottom um, for what uh, we might use that additional state funding for if it comes through. Um, we'd like to remove some of the pain from the uh, individual schools that uh, has been talked about here, that, um, about the school-based reductions. Um, <clears throat> we would like to be able to give our teachers that 3% raise, but it takes money to do that, as has been described. And uh, we uh, don't want to cut into the health insurance reserve if we can help it. Um, and uh, we'd like to reinstate division-based instructional reductions. So um, this is our request to the city. We know that that's pushing uh, beyond what the city has been saying they, they expect to be able to give us, but I think this presentation has documented uh, very conclusively why we need to ask for a bit more than has been um, contemplated on the city side. And I think there's a tremendous amount at stake here for our school system and for the students in our community. Thank you. And just real quick before we transition into questioning, um, I just want to look across the room, city staff, um, and just um, applaud them because we do work very well with the city staff. And anytime we have a question, they answer it, they help us, they provide resources, we'll run things by them and say, what do you think? Um, so we are always willing to work with the city staff and definitely appreciate them. And I do want to just give um, our city manager a shout out. Last year, you did recommend um, additional funding for LCS when we were doing the budget process. And we explained like there's mi many parts that happen um, with this budget process, including city manager, me, the board, the city, the state. Um, so I do appreciate that. Uh, one question that I have received quite often is, well, if the city staff is told to do bring their budgets in at level funding, why is that such a challenge for you? It's slightly different for us than it is for city staff. Um, if I, and please correct me if I mess this up, Mr. Benda, but for city staff, when 
they are charged with level funding. They're really looking at your, your st I like to call it the stuff budget, materials, supplies, uh, purchase services, those things in that part of the budget, try to keep that uh, at, at level or even lower where you can cut. Um, they're not looking at a salary. Salaries are done by the city manager, and the city manager will consider whatever additional revenue that's coming into the city for salaries. On my end, when level funding, it's all in. It's not only the stuff, but it's the staff that I have to come in with level funding. And with 80% of my budget being people and 20% being stuff and not being able to say, let me consider the additional revenue that's coming in, because let me just go back a couple slides here. The additional revenue that's coming in is 68 or 62% just for SOQ funded staff. When you look at just salary increases, that's why we need the city's help. So I just want to make an, uh, that point and just share that um, we are willing to work with city staff to do what's necessary. Our school board is here to work with um, the council to do what's necessary. And I am going to turn it back over to the mayor and to our chair, Dr. Gupta, to lead us through questions. Okay, so as a reminder, by raise of hand or acknowledgement, I will recognize you if you have any questions for Dr. Edwards. Uh, Vice Mayor, I believe you're first. Do you want to stay up there or do you want to sit down? Okay. You can see it so. You got my backup book over there. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I do have a number of questions, but I won't occupy the full scope of my notes. I'll defer back to my colleagues and our friends on the school board uh, for a number of them. I see nowhere in here if this additional request would cover keeping Sandusky Elementary open. Can we get clarity on that? Um, uh, this is based on the school board's decision last fall. Um, So what I was beginning to say is that uh, all of these um, financial planning, looking at estimates for next year, are based on the decision that the school board made last fall that um, in the fall of 2025 we would close T.C. Miller and Sandusky Elementary. That has been the basis of our planning. Um, that um, costs to, to keep those open would cost uh, more than $3 million per year. And we've been told by City Council numerous times in the past, as well as by uh, several different consultants that have helped us with this, that we cannot afford to keep all 11 elementary schools open at the present. So we have responded to that advice from multiple sources in formulating our plan to close those two schools. So we have not produced a budget that's contrary to the school board's decisions. We've been consistent with the school board's decisions. I think that's the best I can say in response to your question. So under this, would it close this year? There's no plan to close them this year. So, so yeah. With the 43.5, uh, that'll be off the table. Can't go for 40.5, that'll be gone. Can't, can't pull your mic up. With this $43.5 million ask, you're asking is Sandusky. Can you hear? I don't know why it's not. It's on. It's on, yeah. All right. So I think you are asking with $43.5 million ask, will Sandusky Elementary stay open in this coming, ac coming academic year? And my answer is yes. I will, I will send you it's uh, that both will stay open, but we'll still have to make cuts, Thank so you. just um, know. My next question is related to, so mm -hmm. I, I fundamentally disagree with the notion that it's a shortfall, albeit um, a budgetary request. Why did the superintendent and why did the school board not initially request, quote, full funding for Lynchburg City Schools if there was going to be this shortfall from the get-go? I'm referring to the $17 million associated with uh, the COVID spending, if the initial request wasn't even for that 
full amount to engage the division and operate it at the level that the superintendent and board is assuming, why wasn't that initially the request from the get-go? I'll take the first stab and then, can you guys hear me back there? See, the microphone system is not working. Yeah. It's not working. I'll take the first stab and then, um, or first, first uh, shot at that question. Um, for the past couple years, uh, when, when my team and I do a budget, we're looking at the short term this year and then the long term, what next year or five years out um, would look like. In 2020, when we received the CARES funding and then we received more CARES funding, um, at that time we were looking at being a team player because we did have a lot of CARES funding and it was also at the time where the city, um, we had just had the issue with the, the College Lake Dam, so there were some, some changes in funding that the city need. There were some projections about state tax that we weren't sure of. And since we as a school division were in a position of use, having CARES funds, we did that. But at that time, I also forecasted what 2024 this current year would look like and that how we could get back on track. So for the past couple years, we have asked for an increment more and more and more to get back on track. Um, that has not been as received by this, this um, count, not this council, but councils in, in previous um, to do that. So, and actually this year we received less. So when looking at um, this current school year, our goal is not only to support Lynchburg City Schools, but we also don't want to bankrupt the city, so we're trying to be fiscally responsible about what our first year looks like and working with the city team and council to plan out what the next couple years look like. So our request was, can we get back on track where we were to start really keeping pace with salaries? We're willing to do the hard work, make the cuts necessary. But that was after several years of asking for a smaller increase um, to get us here. I would, uh, I'll give the folks in the back a chance for the microphone to kick in. Just give a moment. I would ask, oh. Lawyer and yell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would uh, respectfully ask for the question to be answered in some capacity. I think it was answered and to answer it again. Um, if you're suggesting we should have asked for 17.7 .7 million beyond Madam what the Mayor, city was giving um, us pre if previously? If I may, the reason I'm asking the question is not to be argumentative. What is the question? The question is if $17 million shortfall is what is needed to keep the services and all the things that I've heard from the school board that are a priority to serve the students, serve the, the constituents, then why wasn't that the request? Because we felt there was zero chance that it would be honored. Okay, then I would humbly submit that there are problems, in my opinion, with arguing, arguing there's a $17 million shortfall and using that as a, a jab, if you will, to say then you're not giving us everything we need. I'm, I'm just, I am, curious about that and I don't believe the question was answered and uh, I'll give it to somebody else. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lowry. Um, we, did, we did send in a request for more and then we were told to go back to the drawing board pretty much. So we did do that. <coughs> Are there any questions to direct at Dr. Edwards, please? Questions to direct at Dr. Edwards, please. I got a question on your slides here. Slide 12, I believe it was. <clears throat> or excuse me, slide 20, sorry. You finally found slide 12 and realized it's slide 20. So I heard, you know, obviously we just got this presentation and just listening to challenges that we heard. And I heard uh, uh, Reed talk about the utility bills of why there's this great need for increases. I heard that most of these obviously were not the function of more utilization, 
but higher rates. I think was that what I heard from uh, your deputy. Um, obviously, electric and natural gas, the city of Lynchburg has zero control over those rates. But we do have control over water, 100%. The water going more than doubling from 2021 to 2025 means that we would have had to raise the rates 25% per year. We have not done that. So I really question this number going from 225 to 550 if it's really no more utilization, it's the rates. You do the actual annual calculation on that, that's going to be 25% a year in order to double. That certainly had to be more than just the rates going up because city council actually each year votes on the rates. They vote on sewer. We vote on all those things. Donna, did our rates go up 25% a year over the last four years? Not even anywhere close. There's been times when we didn't raise the rates because of certain things. So. When I hear some of these things, I really kind of question. Um, secondly, we're looking at these positions that were SOQ funded, not, and I, I get that. You know, it's a tough thing, but the state of Virginia says, here's the number of positions that are needed for standards of quality. Um, what slide was that on where you had your SOQ positions? Which one? 27, 27 the wrong direction I'm going here. Let's. So with that, on page 20, it had the SOQ and non-SOQ. Here we go. 22. Okay, so the SOQ and non-SOQ, 800 versus 700, basically. So 46% of those are non-funded and con contributed by the state. Those are the positions that I really wonder what can be done. Not all of them, of course not, because obviously there's lots of things that are needed. But 100% of those non-SOQ funded positions come from the local taxpayers. I saw some of the items that were presented on there earlier, like uh, uh, school, elementary school principals. The more schools you have open, obviously the more school principals that are needed. The state of Virginia doesn't say that there is an absolute need for an elementary assistant principal. I see on this slide what the SOQ funding is zero. There's actually six of them. So some of those, I'm sure there's good need. I'm sure there are. We don't know exactly. But when you see those kind of numbers and see those items, I think that is a way that you can begin to pare down this budget. And you because when you're looking at what has transpired and what I've looked at what's transpired over the last 20 years, I've seen things go the opposite direction. I've seen that the, uh, the city council says, hey, you want more money? Well, we'll raise taxes and give it to you. This year, I think the city manager was pretty clear in his budget recommendation, and I think it was pretty clear for several facets. One, there's lots of other needs in the city. Secondly, there's another 202 less kids on the ADM. Fewer. 202 fewer. And, and, and with that, you know, that has to factor into the equation. That's a two and almost two and three quarter percent reduction in this number of students. So um, I do hope that we can come, you know, as I think the city manager said in all his budget and brews, if you want this money and you need more money, it's got to come in one of two facets. City Council is either going to have to raise taxes, which I, I'm not voting for, um, or we're going to have to cut it from other, some other department. That's a tough thing to do. I mean, the city manager presented a pretty darn good budget. Um, he presented it in a facet that doesn't make everybody happy, but it recognized the fact that there are less students and recognized the fact that something's got to, to give on right-sizing. Um, there's options, you know, the, the part, one of the duties of a, of a school board is to actually look at the enrollments and look at those trends and look at what happens and come up with a comprehensive plan and consolidate where you can and be efficient where you can to save resources. 
I think your school uh, board or school division presented the fact that one element of efficiency that you could do is saving $3.2 million. That's something that I recognize it's a tough thing on you all, but which we'll get to when I'm showing some slides uh, in a little bit about the enrollments. That's something that was kicked to you guys, which I realize others should have done that before you. And you're now in a tough position because they've kicked the can, put their head in the sand, haven't looked at enrollment trends like they should have, and just said, oh, no problem, we're going to keep on. Now a tough decision is made before you. Lots of you are brand new on the board. And you're getting the flack for something that really isn't your flack. Literally, that flack should have happened a decade ago. So I appreciate what you guys are all doing. Thank you all for being here where we can have a discussion, uh, an open, frank discussion about how you can manage the enrollments. I do appreciate our city manager coming up with recognizing that we're not raising taxes and here is a good way uh, and here is a program that actually funds from the city perspective the same. I think as, as was stated uh, by Marty, was the fact that the state numbers are just coming in. I think some of the state numbers are coming in an extra four some million bucks in at risk. That's, come, that's funds that can come in that can help alleviate some of the problems. The split of that, those funds are city and state. The city has been given a whole lot more for a lot of years. We're now to a point, I think, that we need to right-size that. So if you can answer the question with regarding the 25% increase in water rates, I'd appreciate that. Is there someone annual. Don't, don't, don't we have happy to share with you the consumption data? I don't have it right now, but I will definitely share that with you. Uh, and that shows that, but I think if you look at that 2021 figure, remember that was the year. So there, uh, so it's fair to say probably there's more consumption from 2021 because the schools were largely closed at that point. Uh, but if you look at the last couple of years, that's when those changes would have occurred. So uh, definitely do, do just take that into account. Um, and that is water and sewer. Uh, Ms. Preston? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, as far as, and, and I understand that, but some of what you said, but having been an elementary school principal, one of the things that I recognize is that just the numbers of students in a particular school doesn't determine the number of administrators that need to be there. There are a lot of other components that, that, that weigh into that. You need to look at the class size. You need to look at uh, how many special needs students you have. You need to look at all of those components too. So to, for us, not being familiar with each of, each of those schools, to make the assumption that we need this number of elementary school principals is, is not really accurate information. We really need to depend on the people that are administrators in those buildings to determine that because my school may need only one person, yours may need two. We're really trying to take questions. If anybody has any questions for Dr. Edwards at this point, please. Anyone? Oh, my council missions. I've got a, just several questions. Is this working? Can people hear me? Okay, good. Um, how many positions have we expanded in the system since 2020, since we first started getting those COVID funds? Do we have that number? How many positions in the system have actually expanded? From use of CARES funding? Just period. How many positions have expanded in Lynchburg City Schools since 2020? I I don't have that in front of me right now, but I can certainly give you the total FTEs okay. over. Um, some things have changed and we've repos repurposed positions. So let me make sure I understand your question. So you want to know if the total FTEs went up or are you interested in, we no longer need X because that doesn't fit our need. So we got rid of that position, but we substituted it with Y, which is your question. My question is, how many positions did we have prior to receiving any CARES or ESSER funding, any okay. COVID funding? So that would be 2020-ish, right? Mm -hmm. And how many positions do we have today? That's okay. the question. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's that, that simple. Um, and then um, 
another question that I have is regarding, as I came in, you guys were talking about competitive compensation for teachers. That is something I think everybody in this room would argue for is very important with retaining uh, excellent educators. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually a pretty ruthless recruiting pool out there right now, isn't it? The other, I think the teachers are getting targeted by divisions within the region and they're trying to pull people, um, you know, from Lynchburg to Nelson or Amherst or wherever. I know that that's happening. Um, however, what I've heard is that we lost a lot of great teachers last year because contracts got out so late. So the question that I have is with that being something that I think the division has some control over, is there a plan in place to get contracts issued by or as close to as May 1st as possible this year? So I can tell you what my colleagues and I do when first the state delays their final budgets, right? Yep. Because the contracts are the, the money um, is available once the state does their final budget and once the city does its final budget, then we can issue um, contracts. And uh, the last couple of years, the state has actually been late with that. The state has uh, been very late. Uh, right. So, um, and then our city deliberations have gone pretty, pretty much to the wire to the end of that as well. So some of the things that my um, superintendent colleagues do when they're working with their board of supervisors is if they're reasonably sure, like some of them know right now exactly that their board of supervisors is going to support 3% or more. So they are comfortable and confident in telling their HR department, get those contracts ready because we've already worked with our board of supervisors. They have supported us. We're looking at what the General Assembly is doing. We're waiting for the calc tool to come and we're going to hit go. Um, and that's just me learning from my colleagues about how and, and what, what they're doing. Um, I would love to be in that position where I am 100% sure of the revenue from uh, city and from the state so that I can hit go on my contracts and get them out before my colleagues do. Uh, but we have not been in that position. My last couple years, at least, even at the city level, there have been times where the, the school board, we have voted in March and we've had to come back in April and change our, our requests and change our plans and, and change things and then go back. So it's, it's impossible for our HR department to have the exact contracts ready until we're pretty solid on the funding. Got it. Um, another question I have here is, has there been any discussion about getting creative with the consolidation plan and looking at things like kindergarten through sixth grade in elementary schools and maybe converting something like Sandusky Middle School into an elementary school? So one of the things that this council's task force asked us to do initially when you had the education task force right before the pandemic was to get an outside consultant to do the facility study. So we started with outside folks and I think that actually was um, probably beneficial for both of us so it wasn't an internal thing where we were looking at what we could do we had an outside uh, Dominion 7 come in and outside and look at our um, our condition of our buildings and then MGT the second consultant come in and look at the programming of our buildings and they came up with the recommendations based on the information that they collected from the various focus group surveys, all kinds of things, looking at the facilities uh, condition. So as far as us, my administrative team or myself saying this is one of the options, we did try to follow a process in using the um, consultants to do, to do those options for us and present the school board with some viable options as to the organization. In addition to what you're saying, um, as far as having a K-6 school, there are other options to have an 8-12 school. There were some options to have pre-K all in their own building, similar to Hutchison, spread pre-K out all the way across um, the divisions, have partner schools. I think at one point Lynchburg had a maybe a pre-K-2 and then a 3-5 configuration. And during those focus groups and conversations, 
um, there, there, there wasn't a support for, that did not come up, I will say that. That did not rise to the level of where they put their um, options that they put to the board. But I guess the question is, has there been, have, have you guys actually looked at being creative in that way? Now being presented with what you're presented, here's the option, the decision was, these two schools are gonna close, right? Are there other ways, so they're gonna remain open obviously for the next year, right? Are there other options, other things that can be looked at, other avenues for implementation after next school year that could potentially do something along those lines if you looked at a K to six model and could leave, if you converted Sandusky Middle School into an elementary school, leave an elementary school in that neighborhood? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer because your question kind of goes above my little pay grade since my board voted in October and they gave me marching orders on where we were going based on what was presented to them. So I will let them um, speak in terms of getting creative and, and try to address your question. M Mr. Trost. Second to kick in, there you go. Marty, let me just address a couple issues here. Number one, if we don't get that funding, Dr. Day put a line item that we're gonna have to close those schools soon, early. I, for one, this is speaking for me, not the rest of the board, but I know other board members feel the same way, would like the opportunity to investigate some of the other out-of-the-box ideas that we asked the, the uh, I guess the, the student parents of Sandusky and T.C. Miller help us try to help everybody. And they, to their word, came and said, let's look at this, let's look at this, let's look at this. We do not have that runway if we don't get the, 40, uh, the $43 million we're asking for. We don't want to have a choice but to close those schools early. I don't think we want to do that, especially because the uh, parents of these students have made a commitment to try to help us come up with exactly what you're asking about, creative ways to, to keep Sandusky, to keep T.C. Miller open. But without that money, th they're probably going to close early. Um, that's just a fact. So that addresses Chris's uh, question a little uh, earlier. Um, so I hope that gives you the idea. So or the answer you're looking for, because definitely we were looking for creative ways to do things. But without the money, there's no time for creative ways to do things. The, the, we made a decision to close these schools based upon the uh, consultant's recommendation, based upon the financials, but we asked the student parents to help us try to come up with some ideas or ways to see what we can do to solve this problem. And to their credit, they've come up with some very creative ideas that without that money, we're not gonna have the time to investigate. I'm not saying that we're gonna be able to solve it and keep those schools open, but at least it gives us a little bit more time to come up with some ideas. So does that give you an answer that you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm not looking for any particular answer. I'm just well, looking, looking, I just want, I just want questions. the response, right? I'm not looking for a, I'm not looking for a specific A solution, answer. you're not looking for a solution. No, I'm not looking for a specific answer. Well, you should I be, that's why you ask a question. No. <laughs> You asked, if that, you asked if that was the particular answer I was looking for. I'm not looking for a particular answer. I'm looking for the response to the question. Well, the response to the and question if, is without that, that money, we are question, closing schools that's the early. To the question. Without that money, we're closing the schools early. And I'll say it, I don't see any other way to do it without that money. Period. Let me just look and see if I got any more questions. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, uh, oh, a different item. Well, hold on one second, Council Councilman. Uh, Dr. Gupta, do you have a... This is why I say the parents have been coming to school board, why don't you rebuild our school? But we don't have the bandwidth or the money to do that. So whether it's the uh, more economical option of $10 million to rebuild the school or a much more regular $62 million, that's the funding which will come from the city hall not from the Church Street office. That's a fact, right? I mean, we don't have the funding capability or the financing capability to build, rebuild any of those schools. And, and, I think the and going back to your question, we did look at consolidation of middle schools, but the, the seats were about 77 less than if you consolidate two middle schools, three into two. So the, the, the seats were not there. But that is with 6th, 7th, and 8th grade in the middle schools, 
correct? No, it was. So, yeah. so consolidating from three to two middle schools would be the current situation where you have sixth, seventh, and eighth grades getting consolidated into two middle schools, the current, all the current middle school students, right? But the capacity at Sandusky Middle School is a building. If you were to make it K through six in elementary school, are there enough seats? Would there be enough seats? Obviously, if you take a third of the population out of the middle school students, you only need two buildings, right? I mean, that's just, we don't need to put that on a slide. We should all understand that. So then if you put the elementary, the sixth graders into, basically, if you retain all your current fifth graders today, one more year in an elementary building, and then Sandusky Middle School becomes an elementary building, what does that do for elementary seat capacity? That's the question. Sandusky, um, I, I know what you, where you're going, but Sandusky Middle, uh, Lincoln, and Dunbar, three middle schools, the MGT was asked if you consolidate them into two, where will we stand? And we didn't have enough seat space for consolidation there. But, uh, but getting combined. Yes, just with three grade levels. Yeah. So if it was only two, if it was like say seventh and eighth, that may be different. And I think if I remember correctly from their study, the long term, when you look at the long term projections, right, you know, that the enrollment is supposed to continue to decline. I think middle school is one of those numbers that's going to continue to decline. So I don't know, because I don't have it in front of me. It was basically a year ago in the same place. We were looking at that stuff. It didn't seem like we were that many years off from getting to the point where we may have to consider consolidating from three to two middle schools when you look at all the information that was presented a year ago. So that's why I posed that question. If we were going to go from, you know, if we're looking for creative solutions, K to six, what does that look like if Sandusky Middle becomes an elementary school? And I know you can't answer that on the spot. I completely get that. Totally understand that. Um, but I'm just thinking about what is one going to be the most um, efficient while also providing the best impact to our educators and students, right? And I'm a business guy. I'm all about efficiency and effectiveness. But end of the day, these are kids. Absolutely, they're human beings. So we got to be careful when we say cut, consolidate these terminologies. Uh, they are not widgets, you know, they are human beings. So we got to be careful taking the emotions of those parents and their loved ones into account. Uh, but having said that, uh, the enrollment future projections, I know where you're coming from and I agree, but those decisions don't apply right now. And I know you're looking at future, but we don't have the space to consolidate in the coming academic year or the year after that. Yeah. So uh, it will require some rebuilding. If it's up to Dr. Edwards, uh, and I agree with her, we don't have money, we will build re Sandusky Elementary School. That's a decent neighborhood, you build a brand new school, build up capacity there, then you got Heritage and uh, Sheffield, you know, in that one mile radius. But those discussions could happen if there's money on the table. Saying, okay, I got $60 million for you to build a new school, and let's work on a consolidation plan. But uh, short of that, we are doing discussions which just looks, um, for a lack of word, a pie in the sky is my word, you know, a dream conversation, but then it will not become a reality. So uh, consolidation will be needed, but then where will we put if we don't have space? You know, do we build a bigger facility and then consolidate with that in mind? And, and I guess probably the point that I'm trying to make is um, one, there's a lot of research that shows us showing K to six actually provides really great outcomes. Um, I encourage you guys to look at it. I'll send you some stuff. And two is let's look at it holistically. These are the buildings we've got. Just because it's a middle school today doesn't mean it needs to be a middle school tomorrow. Just because it's a high school today doesn't, need it, doesn't mean it needs to be a high Well, I know we're kind of stuck there, but you get what I mean as far as let's look at things holistically and we've got X amount of buildings. These buildings aren't very good. We need to get out of inventory. We got to maintain the buildings or we got to keep the buildings that are efficient to operate. And how can we best fit these children into the buildings that we have in the most efficient manner and provide them a great education? I mean, it's that, that, that's the way that I'm 
seeing it in my head. Does that make sense? I'd like to make one comment, if I may, um, before I call on someone else. I think it's very important. We don't offer more confusion to families that are already extremely confused. Um, we have enough emotional parents and students and teachers as it is that have been, as I've said recently, ping-ponged around in a very emotional situation. So while I appreciate creative solutions that can be thought about in future years, on the table right now, we have enough to discuss. And we're talking about the current proposal and presentation at hand. So um, I would like to keep uh, our questions germane to what we're discussing tonight, how we can figure out uh, you know, any questions and, and answers about what's been proposed this evening, and not offer any more confusion or concern out there, people thinking any other schools are going to close anytime soon. Uh, we need to discuss what we're here to talk about tonight. So uh, who, who else had a question I for Dr. Edwards? A question on one of the slides, Madam Mayor. Uh, yes. That is page number, slide number. Hold on, I'm scrolling to it. Uh, 28, and this might end up actually being a city staff question. Um, the bottom bar that's got the numbers, the total, 0, 50, 100, 1, is that, is that in the actual singular number? Is that how many responses we got to the survey? Is that correct? Or is that like hundreds or thousands or tens? It's the overall number of responses. So, so just to be clear, when um, it was mentioned that overwhelmingly this is what the community wanted, that the total number of responses was roughly um, less than half a percent of the population of the city. That's all. Vice Mayor? I have a, Councilman Hoggles, I had a question, but I, I just had a very quick one, or at least I hope it's quick. The 43.7 uh, 43 million, does that get the 3% salary increase for teachers? So the, oh wait, so you can hear me. The, oh. Give me a, th oh, there it is. Okay, the, uh, yet, late yesterday, the General Assembly's version of the um, calc tool came out, and those of you who know superintendents, we don't move left or right until we see it in the calc tool. And what we didn't want to have happen was what happened last year while we did receive an increase from the state, the bulk of that increase was pulled aside just solely for all in tutoring and the chronic absenteeism and the, v and the Virginia Literacy Act. None of that could be used for any of the, the raises that we needed. So we were, we were trying to wait and see what's in the calc tool. Um, on the screen, what we did uh, do, because if, if I'm counsel, I'm probably thinking, if the state gives you more, do you still need that request from us? And I'm going to answer that from just my seat of superintendent, yes. Uh, because what we don't want to do is, we really don't want to make the school cuts. Like, I, I don't want to make those school cuts. I think we've done a a lot of work to get um, support in the classroom. I think you're starting to see the efforts of my staff. And if you doubt it, be a teacher. That's all I have to say about that. Just go in a classroom and be a teacher. You'll get to see how very difficult that is um, and everybody that works in, in a school. So um, we're, we're hopeful that with additional funding for the state when we were doing our, I love your word, meatball math, when we did our meatball math, we were projecting that, okay, we built a budget on 1%, but if we get this, we can do this, we can do the 3%, we won't have to make those deep school cuts, we won't have to tap into our health insurance reserve, because that's just putting a problem into next year, which we don't want to do, and we can uh, keep some of that instructional support at the division level for the, the classrooms and schools. Um, but we would still have to make cuts at the division level. Forgive me, I, I, um, does $43.7 million get us the 3% salary increase for next year? Yes or no, if I can. It does if we get the state funding in additional revenues from the governor's budget. You see the bottom of that screen? 
So right now, currently, it gives only 1% bonus. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. I, I realize not everyone will be able to see the presentation, have access to it, but there are folks watching at home and here. Thank you for the succinct answer. Okay. Uh, Councilman Helgeson, did you still have a question? Yeah, got two things. Um, I guess with this, you know, if the school board is requesting the 43.7 million, you have the city budget that was given to the, or you have the total budget that was given to the city manager. The city manager, we recognize that the funding is split between city and state. If the city gives the same, and the state gives four million dollars more, that's equivalent to going from the city giving 39.7 to now your 43.7. So back to your question as far as it can't be solved other than if it comes from the city taxpayer's pocket, I think that isn't, I don't think that's accurate. If the state now all of a sudden pitches in more, uh, they got the extra funds somewhere in the, in the at risk that I've seen, an additional 4.1 million, that's something that can actually uh, subsidized without having to go back to the city taxpayers. So let's go to the question I was going to ask. Well, let's address, several that. Years, let's address that matter. So, so several years ago, uh, or not several years ago, but a year ago, there was the yeah, proposal. There was the proposal. I have the floor, please. Excuse me. You know what? Let's, let's talk about the truth. I'm not not who has the floor and who doesn't have the floor. Well, bring it up when you have the floor. I'm going to take the floor from Good. you. Okay. So back to the question that I was going to ask. Okay. See, because he raised his voice, the raptor alert comes on, and so <laughs> that's what you got to be that's, kind. I'll, I'll, I thought I'll, we're supposed I'll, to be kind. I'll and fight nice for the this. kids every day. Yeah, I'll fight good, for the good, kids. Good. Good. Yes, you got a panic button. Somebody <laughs> had that. Are so. you panicking? No, uh, we'll I'm not. Wait, let's just wait one second. There is an alert for the school board oh, people. So, are you okay? Oh, let's just time out for one minute, please. We'll race it. We'll recess for five minutes, please. Okay. We will go ahead and reconvene because it's okay. It's fine. Every, we uh, have about 20 minutes left until we have to wrap up and get over to City Hall for those of us on council. Okay. So I believe that who was asking a question? Oh, I think there was a lovely conversation going on over here. Um, Councilman Helgeson, if you'd like to finish what you were saying. It was a lovely, uh, is this on? It was a lovely conversation that we finished and you know, okay. sadly, uh, Randy's going to get censured before the day is out. So, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, buddy, uh, I, yeah. when I'm rude, I'll apologize yeah. to you right away. No, I won't I'm, say if I said it, I'll apologize. Yeah, no, no problem. Uh, so, I was going to ask, my original question was something completely different, but it was about the electric buses. And so, uh, we used to budget in, the, in our city budget for purchasing bu buses. There's a grant, which we don't need anymore, or we didn't need to purchase them in capital budget for buses because we got this grant of these electric buses. Um, and the buses that I remembered when it was accepted, that it was one, we didn't have to, to come up with the capital for it because of the grant. Secondly, it was gonna save so much money on, and now I'm seeing that the utilities are going through the roof. Is, has there been any savings with these electric buses? Are the electric buses working? We don't have the full slate of electric buses right now. I think we have one, and, and Dr. Ward is a lot to address the... Just one? I yeah, thought it was like a bunch of them. No, we're getting a bunch of them. But I'm, I'm just saying, as they're not on road operating right now. But I don't want to misquote what it is. I know we were waiting for the for arrival of the first one to come in this school year, and then more would be coming online. Um, I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, that these electric costs are the costs totaled from the buildings, not necessarily from um, the electric buses that are um, causing higher electricity costs. Thank you. The ones that were on the screen. Question, questions? Further questions? Oh, Dr. Wilder, yes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Dr. Edwards, the staff, um, the school board members, thank you for your opportunity, your time, and preparing information for us. It is greatly appreciated, and we appreciate the hard work you do for our children every day. It is such a, um, it's a challenging position, and we appreciate you. 
Um, just want to also thank you for addressing ADM over the years. I know for the school board time periods, we've always addressed ADM. We've always looked at how we can make our schools better, how we can make them more creative and reach out to other parents, even parents that go to kids go to private schools. So over the years, we have addressed those issues. So I want to thank you for continuing to address those issues by having creative programs, and whether it's more um, career programs, more go center programs of that nature, more um, college level programs. So all these things outside of the box. So I appreciate you in doing that in the school board for addressing those issues. Um, getting back to the, the SOQ positions and the non-SOQ positions, um, can you kind of paint a picture? I see the numbers and I see the information, but it doesn't, it gives me some basic information. But you know, we look at children, they're not a number. Can you kind of paint a picture for me in our community of what it will look out what it would look like without those non SOQ positions, as well as what it would look like if we don't receive this additional $3 million. Right. So first, if we don't have the additional teachers, we are not in a position to maintain um, the support that we get from class size reduction, which allows us um, to have, and, and I think in, in one of your council questions, you have the detail about um, the, the class size reduction funds allow us to have school uh, class sizes somewhere between 19 and 24, 23, 24 for K3. And um, I will just give the parents a shout out. They are not wrong when they talk about the research on small class sizes and small schools. Um, the research is there, although, you know, when you think about small class sizes, you need more personnel and small schools tend to have a higher cost to operate per pupil than larger schools. You don't get the efficiency of scale with that. So if we were to just remove all of these K-5 teachers, we would have, we would see a rise in class size. Um, it would certainly, we would have to collapse schools, obviously, if we don't have all of that staff there that's up on that, on that screen. Um, and, and we'll see those dividends on the other end when we look at test scores and, and performance. Uh, the three million, honestly, and I, I can't say it enough, um, we are at a juncture where this was my prediction from last year when we started the 2024 budget where we needed to be. And in mo most communities, what, the, what we try to do is look short term, long term. So we're trying to build that budget up slowly so you don't have a year where it's an eight million dollar ask or a ten million dollar ask you you project and, and we all do this in our homes we kind of project like it's probably going to go up um, a little bit each each year without the three million um, we are forced to make additional cuts I think you heard our school board say what their options are um, and I will tell you sitting here as a superintendent hearing that one of the options is to possibly close school in the fall and we're almost in April I am sitting here thinking how do we do that in a way that we on the back end of that still have excellent services excellent staff parents who they're already feeling the brunt of this a rushed closure if, if you really want your parents to feel, my parents to feel a certain kind of way, a rush closure will not be very good for this community. It will not be good for our kids at all. The, the, the closure in another year is one thing. And actually, we went to a school board meeting where one of the, the, um, one of the presentations was on school closure. And I believe they said, you want to forecast school closures five years from now. You want to say to families, in five years, this is where we're going to be. Now, you're not wrong, Councilman Mahogelson, when you said that perhaps some of that work should have been done but before I even came down here. And then when I came down here, we went right into a pandemic right after that. But when we came out of the pandemic, we went right into a facility study. So we weren't kicking a can. We're doing the work, and the board did make the hard decisions to consolidate. But we need your help. Th thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, I've, I've been looking at um, all the news and all the like all the the schools in our area, like the counties. All of them are experiencing like three million dollar deficits. All of them. So um, it's like we're kind of aligned with that as well. And just thank you again for all the work you're doing for our children, our community. Um, 
I have seen the impact of, of, of large classrooms. And we don't want, especially in an urban setting, we want to make sure we keep our, our classrooms small and keep our classrooms manageable. And in an urban setting, you need additional resources versus certain other schools. It's been different in an urban school setting. So I do want to remind all of my colleagues, it's different in an urban school setting. We can look at children like they're widgets, but they are children with, with urban city issues. They have urban city challenges. It's going to need more than just this and that. It's going to need some additional resources. So thank you for your support of our children. And thank you to all those parents who are fighting for their children. God bless you. Thank you. I have, um, I guess, a statement. So we've seen parents fighting for their kids and their schools to stay open now for months and um, several schools. And what I've loved about that is, A, I love, I love advocates. I love parents who love their kids. I love uh, teachers who love their schools. And I think it's been great. And I've told parents recently, like, look, it means LCS is doing something really great when you have three schools over the past year that have come with families full, ready to fight to keep them open. So that made me really happy to see our, chambers full, our chamber full of uh, three different schools uh, fighting for their school. What I've also said to families who've come to us recently uh, with, with T.C. Miller and Sandusky particularly is I'm so sorry about how this has failed you because I'll tell you that the, the rollout of this has not been good. It hasn't. I think there are a lot that a lot there's a lot that can be learned from on how not to do this when you're talking about school closures. A lot of expectation management failures and the fact that you've been put in the middle of what really feels like a game has been wrong. And I'm sorry to all of you. I'm sorry to your kids, I'm sorry to the families, I'm sorry to the teachers of those schools, because it's unfair. And I feel like what ha is happening tonight, what I'm looking at, is that how it's been conveyed to me in emails, and I can say to a few of us, was that we thought what we were going to see is um, the school closure somewhere on here that we would be asked to kind of fight for. And instead, what we're seeing is being asked to fight for these other things, or you'll be closed. That's really how it's been positioned. So while I support the Restore program, I believe in it. I've seen the success of it, and I think it's a great thing. And while I don't want to see teachers fired and support positions taken from the schools, and I think a staff bonus is wonderful, to use that as a weapon for us now to have to decide whether these two schools are closed is wrong. That's wrong. Because that's now the position that council's being put in. Either we find $4.7 million to support programs that I'm not saying I disagree with, but if we can't, then these schools will be closed one year early with no place to go, no plan in place, and the staff included, and that's now on us. And if council members don't want to raise taxes, which I promise you there's not going to be four that want to, I promise, then we already have our answer. There's no point in further discussion. So that is where we are. And I think that is a complete disservice. We can just pack up and go home. And I'm so sorry to you for that. Because like I said, I personally agree with what is being asked to be funded here. I really do. But these two schools should never have been put in this position from day one between any, either, either organizations, the school board or the council, because you're not a game.
That's all I have to say. Anyone else? Council missions? One quick question, it's actually on page 189 in our budget on the school's operating fund expenditure summary. Do you have that? Um, does anybody else have their budget book with them? I'll tell you what, and I can, I can just, somebody can pass this over to Dr. Edwards, if that's fine, they can use the page. 189, because I just took a picture of it, so I can speak to it from my picture. Um, there's a, in the non-personnel services section on the budget, on the operating fund expenditure summary, it's showing a, a roughly $3 million increase between other charges and purchased services. What is that? Can I get my CFO to come Yeah, I mean, that's fine. I just think that is a really good question to ask because that's what I kind of look at is where did the big numbers increase, right? And we see the $6.8 million for uh, staff, uh, but then there's $3 million there for yes, good other evening. charges and purchases. Um, I actually vetted that um, increase and did some research on it, and that's anticipated uh, increases in our utilities and costs. So, so purchase services, what is that? That's 920 some thousand, 917,000. Those are other related contracts and services that we pay um, for odds and ends stuff within the, within the school system. So a, a million dollar increase in odds and ends? I mean, that's what no, I'm, trying, that's you're, what I'm you're, asking. Is what's so you're asking about purchase services yeah, or purchase you're services, asking which, about other of charges? Both of them, because combined, you have 917000 in, in purchase services and $2.1 in other charges. So I'm curious about example. Like, what's an example of a purchase service uh, increase of 900000 Purchase services actually was level funded under operations and maintenance. Then is the error from the from the city side and the way that this was presented to us because there's a nine hundred and seventeen thousand dollar increase on page one eighty nine in the budget in purchase services for Lynchburg City Schools. The original taxes. submitted. Uh, I'm looking at the cut budget that we have used these figures um, that we have cut. Okay. I don't have your book. I have a page of your book, so I'm going to do the best I can with the page. Is this the summary page? This is the school's operating fund expenditure summary. Summary. And this is what you guys asked for versus what you're Correct. currently sitting. Correct. But so if that's I'm what not, I'm asking about. If I'm not mistaken, Donna, isn't the summary page backed up by individual pages for which you can see? Purchase services under operations, under admin, under instruction, under tech, transportation, so that you can get an idea of how each area added up to the nine million. Am I am I misinterpreting that's, that, that? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. That in, that increase came from other charges, which is an anticipated increase in our utilities. Okay. So that's where the bulk of the increase so the comes other charges from. and utilities and the purchase services is just something else like subscriptions or Correct. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, that, sir. that was the question I had. I was just curious because I saw that. Yes, sir. Those big numbers. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Just briefly, uh, I'd like to tell you um, or remind you of the starfish story. The starfish story is a child was walking along the beach and he was throwing in starfish back into the ocean. And he was walking along for a pretty long ways and he met an older man and the older man looked at him and said he was, he's doing something that's futile. He didn't want him to waste his time throwing starfish back into the sea. Why are you doing that young man? It's just a waste of time. The little boy picked up another starfish, looked at it, looked at the man and he tossed that starfish back into the ocean again. It makes all the difference for this one. Right? So whether it's Sandusky, whether it's T.C. Miller or LCS Restore, if you give us the funding, we'll be able to save at least one. And it will give us time for two or three others. That's what this is about. It's giving us the time to save these uh, parts of LCS that will make it function well. Without this, the funding, we will be hobbling along with a cane. I'm not trying to offend anyone who has canes. But 
It's, that's how it is. Uh, we don't want to have substandard service. LCS is providing CTE. It's increasing it. It's gonna, that's gonna bring funds to the city over time. We're doing positive things that are making an impact. And we're asking for it, the funding to make the city run, the city schools run very well. That's what we're doing and giving us the time to do it. I have a number of ideas for helping the city to help the schools, but we don't have much time left and uh, we're simply asking for that funding. So uh, if you want some ideas on how the city can join us and not only with um, the Education Foundation and the, the partnerships with the businesses, but how the city can do it. There's, this has, this, we're not reinventing the wheel. This, the city has <clears throat> uh, an opportunity to help us just like other cities help their school systems. So I'd like to talk about that sometime, like teacher incentives, housing, um, a top A mayor's Apple program for incentivizing uh, more income and more, uh, more teacher uh, retention. There's all sorts of things we can do, but please uh, give us what we need and we will, do, we will try to be the best stewards we can of the money that you give us. Thank you. Thank you, I love that story. Um, but what happens next year? So if you got money to get through this year, what happens beyond that? Yeah, well, just from my understanding is it gives us the time to look for other funding, look for grants. We have grant writers um, uh, that have gotten that by experience, not necessarily by training and have won grants for the programs that we have, especially LCS Restore. And, are you talking to me? No. And um, so we will be looking for ways to save money, save the schools, and, and still be efficient and effective with our services, with our uh, LCS services. But the school's still closed though. Well, we have to make a vote on that. So here's, here's also what the money will do is give us a chance to say, okay, we have breathing room now. Now that we have a, a, a couple of extra million dollars, if, we don't, if we're not pressured to close the schools right away, let's see if we can get the 3.2 million, which would save both schools, and, and come up with a plan for those two. Vice Mayor, go ahead. Is the school saved if it still closes next year? Yeah. So, we need a oh, excuse me. We need a majority vote to say I want to either turn TC Mill into a hybrid school, and or keep it running as it is. And the same with Sandusky. We would simply be able we would simply be able to do that much more with much more confidence if we had the money to give us the time to do that. Is it fiscally? responsible for council to make that kind of decision without knowing what next year will bring let me i'll think about it so one thing in the pipeline as you may have heard from the last school board meeting the both houses of the general assembly passed a one person carve out in the sale tax uh, if uh, the governor signs that bill it leaves it up to the localities to put it on a referendum for citizens to vote for city of Lynchburg, it will provide us about $15 million extra each year. So for city manager, I think it provides you the above, uh, capability to borrow money or issue bonds, right, to fund a reconstruction. And that's the, as Mr. Tross said, it provides runway, is if that option becomes open, if the council wants to consider that uh, next year. Um, we do have to wrap up because it's uh, six o'clock. So I believe Councilman Hugginson, if you can pr present your presentation really quickly. As she's coming up here, and we're seeing this these slides. Oh, oh you got that. So I knew it was this. <clears throat> Put yours up. No, 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 great. You're, you're doing great, sir. Just uh, you said to push one little button. I know, and I made it difficult. Here and you go. And I pushed one little button. You're great. Push one little button. There you go. Okay. And I want to, it, it's great to see everybody here today. You know, we've heard lots of things about um, the latest problem. So we got to look at this long term. And when you look at what's happened for a long time, we've seen the population of Lynchburg go from 66,000 up to about 82,000. We've seen that population of Lynchburg increase about 21.6%. Over the same 25 years, we've seen the school population, the ADM, 
declined from somewhere around 9,400 down to somewhere around 7,100 or 7,400 if you're using membership or ADM. Uh, 7,100, I believe, is the, the latest, uh, or 7,200 is the projected in, in calcs. So that's a 21.5% decline in enrollment. We're now here sitting there saying, okay, what are we gonna do today? And like I said earlier, some of you are brand new on the school board. Some of you are brand new on council. Some of you are brand new in city management. Some of you, lots of people that are brand new and saying, oh my gosh, if we only had some runway, we could actually solve this long term. I've been talking about this for about 20 years. What we've seen is the fact that there's been this decline in enrollment. What's supposed to be done when enrollments are declining? There is what's called the comprehensive plan that the school division is supposed to manage the enrollments. That's one of the duties actually of the school board. When enrollments are declining, you're supposed to manage those and consolidate where you can, have efficiency where you must. And with that, because you're looking out for those efficiencies. When we've seen this very large decline, sure, today we're up, uh-oh, what are we gonna do? Are you gonna add another 3.2 million bucks to the budget so you don't have to close the school today? And it's looking like it's rushed. And the folks at Sandusky or TC Miller or Deerington or any of the schools thinking, oh my gosh, this is terrible. That plan should have been there for the last decade. The plan for the comprehensive plan. Look at, look at what was submitted to our, the, the, the state superintendent. There wasn't even a plan for managing enrollments. Look in there, it was deficient, deficient. Somehow these last two years says, oh, it passed. Have we seen a plan that has managed enrollments? That is signed off by the superintendent and the school board chair. I haven't seen those plans. With that, that would give you more runway to where you could have done this. You know, these, these numbers as we're looking at now, guess what? They come from Cooper Weldon. They come from the fact that what is happening now in the future? What does Cooper Weldon say if we're gonna project going forward? It projects another 500 less kids going forward. With that, the comprehensive plan, managing enrollments is critical. When Crystal first came, her and I met at her office. I said, hey, great, good to see you here. I've been an advocate for improving education. I don't like to spend money on things unless we're getting some results. She said, hey, we have this group that is meeting to see what we can do to consolidate, what we can do to streamline. They were meeting, that group got just canceled out of the blue. Crystal promised and said, hey, we're gonna be doing this and we're gonna be looking at this. Now, lots of you are brand new and you're on the school board and you're hearing from folks that are out there saying, oh, well, you did a bad job, you did this. No, you didn't. You're thrust into a thing with your backs up against the wall. You recognize that you have a declining enrollment. You recognize that the city population and the city budget more is allocated towards making sure we're safe, make sure we got more fire departments and lane miles and all that. So with that, we've seen lots of changes. So. I think we've had lots of opportunity to actually look at this. Granted, you're, uh, lots of you are brand new and it looks like you're thrust into it. Citizens and those that want to save your school particularly, give them the benefit of the doubt for crying out loud. Lots of them have just got here and this should have been done by the administration for the last 15 years. This decline didn't just happen today. This decline has been going on for 25 years. You look at this decline as a percentage of ADM. We used to have a budget that said, okay, we're gonna give so much for the city budget. Is gonna be a function? Well, yeah, back when the city budget, 14, over 14% of the population was going to Lynchburg City Schools. Made a sense. Now we're at 9%, it's changed. So with that being the case, I do hope that you guys will come up and live within your means. I'm glad the city manager has presented a balanced budget to us. If we do anything different, what it's gonna happen is we're gonna to have to raise taxes, and I agree, uh, when Stephanie said, we're not gonna to vote to raise taxes, or we're gonna to have to cut that money elsewhere. I'm thankful that the state, I believe, is giving that extra 4.1 million on ADM. And when we look at the, or, or uh, based on at-risk, when we look at the budget, how much is actually given, I think the overall is gonna be growing, the overall budget, in spite of the city local taxpayer giving the same. 
And again, you look at these charts and I think it is pretty clear. I have these for you and Randy is gonna pass them out to you since he's gonna, it's right there in the yellow, or I'll pass them. I guess, I guess I'm done. Okay, go ahead. Uh, what I don't understand is if the population has declined over that time period, how come we need more money for fire and safety? No, the population has increased. I thought you told me the population has decreased over no, this time the, the period. The city population has increased 40, 21, oh, sorry. Look, look at the bottom. So the population change of Lynchburg has grown 21.6%. That? Okay. That's the blue graph. Got it. Okay, the I got school you. Pro school population has decreased 21.5%. But where do you take into account inflation? You don't. Because over that time period, I, and granted, the uh, school population, there may are fewer students, but inflation, especially over that time period, has gone up, and the cost of everything is more expensive. So granted that, and um, I mean, we're looking at charts over a 20-year time frame, 25-year time frame, and you know time value of money, rule of 72, and you look at inflation, those the time value of money, the most in, strongest thing when you're investing or preparing for cost projections is you want to take into account inflation. And I just don't see that happening in our school budget. Um, and, I, and I agree with some of the things you're saying, I do. There was more, so there's a lot more money given in this year's budget than there was in the 1998 budget. I guarantee that. I, I so it's a lot more money. This isn't, has nothing to do with the actual budget. Well, and, and we're not, but here, and the other issue is um, the local funding has gone down, correct? Local funding has been the same. What? The local funding uh, has. Uh, inflation adjusted. If you adjust for inflation from one year to the next, you I'm can talking, say. You, I'd talk multiple years. For, for multiple years, the when you contribution for city schools from the city budget over my last 20 years has done nothing but go up. Well, let's talk about the past five years. I thought we're doing talking level funding over the past five years or so. No, just talking about level funding for this next year, according to the city manager. And going back, I thought there was about the same amount of money. Is that not true? You have a slide. But my ultimate issue is how do we grant it fewer students, although I will say equal, if not more, higher need students that do require more resources. We do have some very awesome schools that are outside the public school system, but guess what? They're not necessarily taking our higher need students. So we are cost or we are left with the students that do cost more to educate. And I get back to the ultimate thing that I always say, pay me now or pay me more later. If we do not educate these higher need students that we're working on through our CTE program, through our uh, restorative academy, through trying to save T.C. Miller and Sandusky and converting T.C. Miller to maybe a hybrid program with an early start program, if we don't invest in these children at this point, and granted, it's going to take 10 years. It's going to take 15 years. It's going to take time. We are going to be paying more later. We're going to have skill-less or skill-deficient people running around our community requiring more resources out of our community, which is going to be more tax dollars. I just don't want to see that. And I see one of the things that we can do at this point is we break this cycle of poverty with skills and education. I don't see any other way around it. And whether it's, it wasn't done 10, 15, 20 years ago, I want to start it this year in 2024. That's all I can say. All right. Good, good stopping point. Thank you, Mr. Trost. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me, Madam Mayor. Of course. Mayor. Of course. And you know what? I agree. And I think, um, like I said, I... I I think what you're proposing are, are worthwhile investments, and I believe in the Restore program, and I believe in investing in our kids, because if we don't, exactly what you said. I go to the schools, and while I may be newer on council, I'm not a new mother. I've raised four children, and I've been in our schools with our kids here, and I've learned so much the last year and a half on, on, uh, about their needs, and if we don't invest, you're exactly right. Um, they end up not being able to get jobs and they end up falling into um, things that they shouldn't fall into because they have no hope and no choice. So you're exactly right. I just feel bad that we have two schools that are stuck in the middle of it. Um, and I want to say this. 
Uh, while well, I said earlier about the three schools being proof that LCS is doing a good job, LCS is doing a great job in all their schools. So I want to say that, and, this, and the teachers are wonderful as well. So I don't want anybody to say that that was only about those three schools. All right. Um, so please don't take that from what I said earlier. And I do want to thank the members of the school board. This is not an easy job for anybody. So thank you for your hard work, Dr. Edwards and your team as well. Thank you for your hard work as well. And to my members, uh, fellow members of city council for the continued collaboration and to the city staff also. Everybody that uh, put work into making tonight happen. Thank you, all of you. We are recessed now until 7 p.m. where uh, city council will reconvene in city hall and council chamber to conduct our regularly scheduled meeting. Thank you so much. <laughs>